podcast. This is number five of these podcasts, and I intend to go on much more and record more. There's been a bit of a break because I've come to Chile uh, for the first time to meet my son, uh, which has been a wonderful experience. And and now I'm here. They wouldn't let me in for five months because of COVID. So so now I'm here. I'm very happy. And today I'm going to be joined by someone. I am joined by someone. Paul Carden. He's a really patient fella because we've actually already done one of these podcasts. Uh, but due to technical problems at my end, it didn't quite work out. But this is a story that must be heard. This is uh, a man that must be listened to. Um, this is a really interesting, he's released a really interesting book, Return to Bomb Alley, 1982, The Falklands Deception. And um, I want to introduce you now. So, Paul, uh, tell us a bit about yourself uh, in your own words. OK, Charlie. Um, as you can see, it's taken me a long time to eventually write this book. It's taken 40 years. <laughs> so um, um, the, 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 the thought of doing a book first occurred to me um, probably a couple of years after the uh, after the event. You know, so in about the mid 80s, I thought, oh, I'd, I'd love to get my thoughts down on paper. And because um, I always had sort of questions in my mind. Um, after I came back from the Falklands, I wasn't happy with the way uh, the whole thing had been conducted. And the longer time has gone on, uh, the more the, the more sort of um, the deeper the questions have become. And I thought I'm going to have to uh, get my story out there. So uh, uh, that's what I've done. I've put a book. I've, I've got a book out there. How, how does it feel to become um, an, an author then? To go from, because uh, I, I, I know we, we've talked about this. I'm, I'm going to let everybody else into the world of you because um, you, you in between that, you've done a lot of other things. Um, yeah. And was there a time where you thought, well, obviously I'm not going to tell no story now because I'm just doing normal life, you know, I'm just doing the normal stuff. Yeah, well. I mean, every sort of 10 year anniversary. So in 1992 and 2002 and 2012, it, it, it was in the media. Every 10 years, there was it was given a lot of attention, you know, so I was picking up on that. And every time that happened, uh, I thought, I've got to do something, you know. And eventually I have. And it got to the stage where I thought, I better do it while I'm still here, you know. Yeah. <laughs> you know, because time, you know, time goes on very quickly. So, uh, um sorry what was your your question then johnny well really the question is is w did you think that you were going to be able to tell this story and obviously um you've had the like a, like you say the spark of 10 year anniversaries etc um that that's something that always baffles me why people are, are only wait till the anniversary to look back on something it's like almost like you can ignore all of the pain for 10 years and every 10 years you just got to take it in for a bit to to make everybody accept it but um I mean, it's yeah. really it's it, it it doesn't seem like the as people have woken up to the tomfoolery of people in governments, to nation states, to intelligence services, etc. Um, yeah. I, I it, it's I think people have become more likely to tell all of their stories now. They feel a lot less afraid. Was there any time where there was like a bit of fear about? Was it like for the first 10, 20 years, were you thinking maybe I should, but what if I do and et cetera? Yeah, I did think about that because I did sign the Official Secrets Act. You know, every forces member does sign the Official Secrets Act. So that How is long does that last for? Well, it lasts for your whole life. Oh, well, but, you're in trouble uh, then, sunshine. <laughs> <laughs> Not really, because the, long, the more time that goes on, it's been sort of modified as time has gone on. And if I was telling this story in 1985, so and I, I released this book in 1985. I could possibly land me, myself in hot water. Mm -hmm. But with it being now 40 years ago, uh, there's been cases against people as, as time has gone on. And the law has been changed so that um, as time goes on, you, 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 it's easier to speak now. They're less likely to come after you. Yeah. Uh, and after 40 years, I don't think they're going to come after me. I, I doubt it. Yeah, from someone who um, I went, I, I study intelligence agencies through the years, and something happened in the mid 90s 
um, and late 90s where they realized the technology was, I think, too advanced to hide anything anymore. And so they had to find new mechanisms, new ways to distance themselves from the the problems that they would cause. And that meant a lot of the older problems, things like Falklands, et cetera, and other things we'll talk about, um, were uh, able to be seen as, oh, well, we'll let that, those stories be told now. They're far enough away in history. Um, yeah, yeah. yeah. I think, do you know what I think? I think the intelligence service services are likely to be 10 years ahead of us in the technology they use anyway. Just to keep give that bit of separation, to give themselves an advantage, you know, it sounds a bit um, conspiratorial, but um, I, I think they want it to sound it, uh, conspiratorial. I mean, the, the the fact is, is that a lot of this technology that we're seeing now is uh, already um, was already being used ten years ago. Uh, they have to build infrastructure for it, though, and so they yeah. usually build temporary infrastructure. Um, Let's, I'm down here in south of the equator. I'm down in Chile at the moment and hopefully be here for a while. Um, and I'm next door to Argentina. Uh, I, and I mean, a lot of people who are going to be listening to this are probably going to be from an American or global audience that maybe missed the Falklands growing up because they wouldn't have seen the anniversaries necessary, necessarily. So can you give people an idea of where the Falklands are and or the Malvinas, I think they're called um, down here. Uh, so, so can can you give a, a, a sort of like a, a basic understanding of where this whole theatre of war was happening? Okay. Well, the, the Falkland Islands themselves are 400 miles off the coast of Argentina, which itself is down the, the bottom end of Argentina is down at the, the southern end of the continent of South America, very near to Cape Horn. It's a huge country and it, it it extends a long way up and I don't know how it's a lot bigger than much bigger than the UK you know yeah 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 but, well I know that, that Chile is around 3,000 kilometers or 3,600 yeah. kilometers long and Argentina is a little bit uh, less in length yeah. than that I think so it is very long yeah yeah but with regard to um on a sort of global scale with respect to the UK it's actually uh, 7,900 and something, so 8,000 miles away from the yeah. UK. So it, it seems a little bit, I mean, for a lot of people, they would say, OK, so you've got this little island in the middle, <laughs> in the middle of nowhere, really, um, yeah. with the only neighbours being Argentina. Um, why were the British there in the first place? Why is this called the Falkland Islands? Well, do you know what you're going, I think we're going back to 18... Something when uh, I didn't really research this subject for for the book, but I think it was the early 19th century when the British landed there. I mean, somebody could correct me on that, but I think we were there then. I think it changed hands a couple of times, possibly before that. And uh, then in 1982, obviously, there was the invasion. And um, to be totally honest, the population of the UK. I'd say 99.9% .9 of them didn't know where the Falkland Islands were. I think a larger amount probably had heard of them, but still didn't know where they were, you know. Um, yeah. So to us on our ship, and I think on every ship, everyone was quite startled to hear that um, there'd been an invasion. And um, when they heard where the islands were, that, that was a bit of a shock, really, because it was so, so far away, you know. Yeah, it doesn't make it, I mean, it doesn't make, it's going to make less sense to, to people who don't understand uh, colonialism I'm, 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 and, and the ownership of islands as well. I mean, this is something that um, Britain has done really well over the years, uh, along with America and other countries, is taking those island nations and using them as things like tax havens and, 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 and things that they can yeah. use offshore and be detached from their main um, country. And that is something that is partially to do with that, because on the run up to this, to the Falklands War, there was um, a kind of detaching of Britishness from the islands, wasn't there? Yeah, there was. And if we set it into the, um, the history, really, from the Second World War, as we all know, lots of... Um, former colonial countries were gaining their independence 
the Falklands was a bit different because the islanders, there were 1,800 of them at the time in 1982, they were always very pro-British, so it, it seemed to be unlikely that they would ever want to have independence. They did, they did want to be uh, to carry on being uh, connected to the sort of motherland, you know. Mm. Um, but when you say there was a detachment, there was. Um, I mean, Miss, if we set, if we, if I give you a bit of background, uh, Mrs. Thatcher was elected in 1979. Um, in May 1979. <laughs> and, sorry, uh, sorry. And um, I, I can remember it quite clearly. I was only sort of, what was I, 18 or 19 then? And um, I remember that a lot of women voters were very excited about the thought of having a female prime minister for the, for the first time. So I think that gave Mrs. Thatcher a big boost, you know, and yeah. managed to get her over the finishing line, you know, because she didn't have a big majority, about 30 seats, I think. It wasn't the biggest majority ever. Um, but she got in and she she was she got in on a high, you know, she was quite popular at the start. Um and then in nineteen eighty we had the Iranian embassy siege. I don't know if you remember that. That was uh, it took, it lasted about six days and it was in April, May uh, nineteen eighty, down in London. There's been many a serialization and documentaries made of those. I mean, they've really, uh, every time that you uh, see one of those, you've got all the SAS, these supposedly yeah. secret service I guys. Actually, and... I actually know one of the guys, uh, Rusty Furman, he's a friend of mine and he lives just uh, close to me in New Brighton, you know. I, I, uh, I mean, does, does he? What, what's his opinion on that siege? Does he think it was uh, all, it, all it looked like it was? You know what? I haven't really talked to him about that in detail. Mm-hmm. But he's a very he's a very clever guy and he's his own man, you know. So if you ask him a question about that, he'll give you a very honest honest answer. I think, you know, I, I think I, I I'd suggest now you should get him on your show. Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I will. Yeah, that would be uh, that would be good because think... you come from a place though where um, it's very real compared to what London is. Because we're talking about when we're talking about Margaret Thatcher and we're talking about parliament and these guys that live down in the southwest of uh, uh, southeast of england um a lot of people don't realize that britain in general is such a mixed place and of course you're yeah. you're by a, a, a more closer a working class uh place aren't you up near liverpool we are merseyside yeah there's a lot of, there's a big irish contingency um there's a big influx of, of irish people um after the famine sort of thing so yeah. um and on Merseyside generally, uh, we are we're more sort of down to earth, and we are working class. And um, conservative politicians are not popular people around here, not at all. You know, it's always but been is, a labour heartland. Yeah, yeah. Is there a belief um, that uh, you know that still the army and the navy and stuff like that and the air force are really important? Uh, in that area do you feel do you feel that it's different to when you were younger because obviously you joined the navy you decided i come from this and i want to i want to serve my country um it, it's really a weird situation back then to explain to people the 70s and the 80s especially where people who like trying to explain to people why working class people who felt completely separate from this london elite would uh, do their bidding in a sense. So. Yeah, well, it's the, the, MM, the Ministry of Defence, you know, the Royal Navy, the Army, the Air Force, they're very clever when it comes to advertising who they are and for, for recruits, you know, mm-hmm. they're very, very clever. They make it look exciting. Uh, they make it look like you're going to travel, which you do. There's no denying that. Um, and I think that's what tempts people in, particularly if they come from working class areas where there's, you know, there's a lot of unemployment. You know, they think, God, God, I've got to do something with my life. You know, they, they, end up, they, don't, they don't necessarily join to serve Queen and country. They, they join to travel or they join because they think there's going to be a bit of action or whatever. That, that sort yeah. of thing. Do you know, do you, I mean, it, it rings true for me. When I was, uh, I was uh, 10, 11 years old, around that age, I'm coming from South Wales, it's working class being completely and utterly um, attacked by the Thatcher government. Um, the mines all closed just north of where I lived. 
Uh, my dad was a steel worker. His job was under threat. Um, he marched next to the socialist leader Arthur Scargill back in the day, and he was he was always he was always uh, the, out with all the rest of the people in our, our city were were defending the working class, etc. But when I reached about ten, eleven, there was so little opportunities in Cardiff. I remember me and my friend, um, a guy called Steve. Steve Gouchy, I'm sure you won't mind me mentioning his name, but I haven't seen him since about when I was 11. We went to different high schools and we went to the local barracks. And we went to Mandy Barracks in Cardiff. And we, we were, we, you know, we had decided we were best friends. We wore the same coats. We had the same clothes. Like, you know, we were, we were that type of best friends stomping around the place. Like, yeah, we're going to do everything together for the rest of our lives. Um, and we went to Mandy Barracks. And I discovered that I would have to own a pair of boots and my parents would never be, would never afford to be able at that point to, to actually, even my dad was on a good wage, but I think he was, you know, cheating around and doing naughty stuff. So he was spending all his money elsewhere. Yeah. And, um, and as soon as I found out that, that I needed to buy a pair of boots, it's like, oh, well, the army's out of the question for me. And Steve was like, yeah, same for me. So we, we didn't become cadets. We were, that was what the plan was. Let's, let's go, let's learn how to fire guns and do all of these things. You know, they, they had advertised that to us. So I can, I can, I really can understand that. So by this time, you've got what, 1982. And um and you're sailing where? We were. I was on HMS Yarmouth, which was an anti-submarine frigate, and it was about, about the same age as me. So you know, it was commissioned in about 1960, and um, I was on that ship. About 240 of us, I think, on that ship, and we were actually on our way to the Far East on a deployment. Um, and this was going. To, we were going to go to Singapore and Malaysia and lots of other wonderful places. And all of us were really fired up about that. You know, we were really, really been looking forward to that. And that was sort of March, April uh, 1982 when we were just uh, sailing across the Med. And I was in front of, I, I was a leading radio operator. So was, I, I was a communicator. And I'd see all the messages that came in uh, over the wires, over, over the waves from, um, uh, the headquarters in London, CNC fleet, and a flash message came in, and I saw it come. And I was the first one to know on our ship that we were not going on this deployment because mm-hmm. when this message came in, it basically said, "Turn around, go back to Gibraltar, refuel, rearm, take stores on, then after that, go and join the HMS Hermes battle group in the Atlantic." And then sail down to Ascension Island, and then sail down to the Falklands. So, I, I I picked that message up, ripped it off the top of the tally printer, and I thought, what should I do with this? And part of me said, should I rip it up? Great no, power. Not. Great <laughs> yeah. power comes great responsibility. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, did you did you crap yourself a little bit though? No, not really. I, I, um, it hadn't sunken in at that time. Uh, I mean, we'd all been briefed in Gibraltar previously that the islands had been invaded by Galtieri. But we didn't think it was really going anywhere. You know, we, we thought this would be sorted out with peace proposals, whatever. Then we'd all bugger off back to Argentina. At that point, there was no reason for crapping yourself. The crapping mm-hmm. yourself came later. You know, and we'll come on to that yeah, later. Yeah, yeah. Um, we, we got back to Gibraltar and then it kind, it kind of sunk in for a lot of us that this this could be the real deal here because they started issuing us with dog tags, which is basically a piece of string with a, a little a little medal on with your name, your number, and I think blood type, stuff like that. But that, that was there for a reason because if you ended up dead, that would be there to identify you. And, you know, people started thinking, wow, this, I wonder where this is going to go. You know, so... Yeah, yeah. They were a punk fashion statement when I was young as well. <laughs> I used to wear a set of dog tags <laughs> just to just to be a punk. That's a, <laughs> it's amazing how that works. That must be yeah. That must be extremely uh, interesting. So you turned around. You went back to Gibraltar. Uh, I yeah. think you, did you, the ship didn't stay in Gibraltar long, did it? We were there for three or four days, and then we I think we joined up with HMS Broadsword. And then sailed uh, out into the Atlantic and met up with the Hermes group as planned. 
And then we started sailing down very, very slowly at first, because at that time, um, Alexander Haig, who was the um, American Secretary of State <clears throat> at the time, he became the sort of go-between of the two countries, Britain and Argentina. So he was trying to broker a, a peace deal. And um, uh, I was in charge of the what was called the Starboard Watch radio team in the main communications office. And we'd be monitoring. The, we, we'd have the World Service on, you know, the BBC World Service. Mm-hmm. Very often. I'm hearing the truth. <laughs> we get more news from the back then. We get more accurate news from the BBC World Service than we would from the equipment around us in the radio room. Yeah, yeah. But um, not all the time. Thinking back, there were certain things they said that were a bit questionable, you know. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but, yeah. but anyway, uh, we, we were monitoring these peace deals as they came and went, as we sailed further south. And the further we got south, the less likely it looked that there was going to be a, a, a successful, um, peaceful outcome. Yeah, I got I got to warn everybody here. If you can hear uh, a mixture between ghost noises and babies crying in the background, is because Chilean houses are made of wood, and there's uh, two women with babies in the next room. So uh, that that is from my house, my head, not Paul's. Um, so where did you go after Gibraltar then? When you st- when you met up with the group and you started uh, uh, the the battle group, I suppose is it called a battle group? Yeah, it was called the battle the battle group. Well, it was called the task force. That, yeah. that was a sort of official name that became known as the task force and the, the name of the operation was operation corporate mm-hmm. and the guy in charge of that was rear admiral sandy woodward and he was based <laughs> on hms hermes um so he was, he was the guy in overall charge of what went on in the south atlantic on the uk side and then uh, the, the guy in charge of the whole operation was Admiral Fieldhouse, who was based in Northwood, uh, uh, which is a, a base in just north of London. So that's C and C Fleet or Commander in Chief Fleet. That yeah. was Admiral Fieldhouse. Um, but do, do you know what, Johnny? I think we need to go back um, to Mrs. Thatcher again, because as far as I'm concerned, um, the whole premise the um, conflict was questionable from the start and if we look at the way Mrs Thatcher and her ministers behaved at the time it's all come out now it all came out in 2012 when I say it all came out not everything has come out because a lot of things uh, they've actually banged another 40 years on top so yeah. a lot of it I'm <laughs> out yeah, so yeah. I'm not until I'm 92 in the year 2052, that's when we'll uh, that's when we'll discover everything. We may not even discover it then, but we're, we're, that's what we're told at the moment. But if can I just jump back, Johnny, and tell you yeah. about some of what went on um, uh, just after the Iranian embassy siege, when Mrs. Thatcher was on a high, mm-hmm. um, she could only go down from that point, and she she certainly did go down because she had economic policies which were called monetarist and they were very unforgiving um, policies for working class people like me and you and very quickly we had three million people unemployed in the UK and rising and we also had uh, uh, the inflation rate was double what it is today it was 18 percent back then so it was rocketing inflation and um, there was unrest in at the party and in, in the Conservative Party. Come, mm-hmm. come the invasion, there were about 60 Tory MPs. So this was double her majority. They were unhappy with Mrs. Thatcher and wanted a, a new face, you know. Yeah. So she had all the pressure building on her. And um, come the end of 91, 1981, she had an approval rating of just 23%, which is the lowest approval rating on record for any UK Prime Minister. And that includes David Cameron during Brexit. He was really yeah. rock bottom, but he, well, he didn't go. He didn't sink quite as low as Mrs. Thatcher did in the nineteen eighty. Well, the lady's not for turning, but she's certainly for bursting into flames and falling downwards, isn't she? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And, and, and something else I forgot to say is that we had um, we had riots breaking out in nineteen eighty one. You, mm-hmm. I think you'll remember that. Well, I, 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 I mean, I was born. 
1980. So I would be yeah. one here. But yeah. what my memory is, is looking, I, I mean, we have, you, you know, you don't get shown TV programs of the time and remember them at that age. But those uh, pictures of the early 80s of when I was born, when I yeah. see them uh, around, it's always um, the working class being beaten up by uh, police on horseback and had some terrible pictures, of course, of the mining communities being um, just attacked. They, these were working class people who were attacked by what was an elite uh, that didn't believe in society. So, I mean, well, it's, it's it's fantastic to go back and see what that era looked like because it just looks yeah. dystopian. And it, it, it was like that in 1981, between April and July in 1981, we had riots, breaking out, like I say, in, in every major city in the UK, in London, in Birmingham, in Manchester, and in Liverpool, and in other places, it, there was a lot of unrest, you know. But Mrs Thatcher, like you say, wasn't paternal, she carried on with those economic policies, and she even increased taxes as well on top of that. And uh, lots of economic experts were in uproar over that, because th they said, look, if you increase taxes, it's going to immediately impact the industrial base, the manufacturing base in the, in the UK. And sure enough, every, places started closing, steelworks, mines, they all started closing very quickly. And she carried on with that. And then we had the mine, miners strike in 1984, and the rest of the mines went after that. Yeah. But she, she, she was sort of setting, she was laying down her, her plans in the very early 80s, and she stuck to them. She she was not pretending. She stuck to them. But um, do you get a feeling a lot of that was um, policies that we wouldn't? I mean, it, like you say, the technology is uh, uh, already ten years ahead. But so are the policies in many uh, respects. So now we see a lot of what we see now is to prepare us for this technological fourth industrial revolution. So where we think it's for COVID or for this or for that, and we're told other things. In actual yeah. fact, these policies are being carefully interwoven into our society, and so that they can pull that rug from under us, that comfortable rug that we're used to from under us. We're, we're putting up a fight. We're, I think we're putting up a really good fight on this one, what's happening now. Mm -hmm. and I, I don't think they have been able to roll out everything that they want to. Yeah. No, I think, I they, think they, they were... I, I, they, they seem... Yeah, they seem very... I, I don't think they could ever have... Uh, I'm not sure they 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 people are too intelligent to go back to that thing where it'll just be riots breaking out because the other yeah. thing that I notice if you go back to uh, the late 70s and the early 80s the time of of Thatcher's peak if you go back um, to those days and you see uh, the people talking when they're asked questions on the street most people don't have a clue about the basics of politics and how it works now everybody's very clued up um, yeah. they can't you know it won't be riots the same so you see the crackdowns right. in Canada happened they started getting authoritarian they brought in um, riot police from all around the world it was uh, everything from from uh, every every uh, sort of authoritarian country sent support to Canada to stand against families who were saying yeah. we're not going to riot we're not going to cause trouble we're going to have barbecues we're going to have fun we're going to enjoy ourselves and we're going to say this is a society we want to create and that's the society you want to create so no no longer can they create that PR they're not in control of the PR machine anymore um, as well as that that downfall of the press when you're talking about um, you'll get most of the information from BBC World News I don't think there'd be anywhere else you could go for the information back then you know you'd have to go they, you were forced funneled into that now we did have a, we did have a choice actually Johnny we did have a choice we had Voice of America as well <laughs> yeah <laughs> Well, not really a choice, you know. But, uh, there you go. Yeah. Well, and, and I, I, I said this uh, last time we spoke is that that that, that thing of, of Reagan and Thatcher were very mirror image of each yeah. other in a lot of their policies. Um, as as you know, as we get towards closer to an a globalist ideal, we, we're more likely to see that happen. And I think ever since World the World War Two, we've been approaching that. So that's why we've seen that uh, symmetry happen. So you you were let's get back. Thatcher, she's she's not she's not a popular lady. And so the Falklands is a, a hurrah. This is a good thing for Thatcher, isn't it? 
Yeah, it was. And I need to give you a little bit more background about what she was up to in 1980 and 1981. Now, let me think now. (laughs) Let me think. It's quite, there was quite a lot going on um, behind the scenes. And Mrs. Thatcher was fully aware that a lot of her activity would not be seen um, because of the 30-year rule, which we all know about. It's now become the 20-year rule, but back then it was the 30-year rule. And everything she did in 1982 or in 1981 or 1980 would not be discovered until, behind the scenes, that is, would not be discovered until 30 years later, which really, really serves uh, politicians because they they can do a lot of stuff behind the scenes and um, manipulate events and manipulate elections even. Uh, I'll tell you, the the first thing she was doing was she was doing high level trade talks with um, Galtieri um, uh, back in the the early 1980s. And she was doing that behind the backs of the Falkland Islanders. So they didn't get a say on that. They didn't even get to find out about it until 2012. So that was, that was one incident where you can see that the Falkland Islanders have been left on, on, on the side, left to a uh, struggle sort of thing. And then another thing was in 1981, Mrs. Thatcher brought out the what was called the British Nationality Act. And what this did was um, for several overseas dependencies like the Falkland Islands, it branded them as foreigners and it said you can no longer settle in the UK because in the past uh, they had been able to apply and settle in the UK if, if they felt like doing that. She took that away from them, snatched it away. And um, um, that, that that's another sort of thing that I think that one was out there. We did know about that, but uh, there was a lot of other stuff going on. There were arms deals going on between the hunter the fascist mm-hmm. hunter and the conservative government, and they yeah. didn't stop until four days before. Isn't yeah. it extraordinary? And it's w- one of the things you can see um, their real face when you actually follow arms That's deals. Arming the future enemy. Yeah, yeah. 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 Um, I, I, I tell you what, I'm, I go through uh, history. Oh, man, at the moment, I'm, I'm, I'm on like five different investigations and they're really complex, really uh, loads of stuff happening. Some of them are slightly interwoven. Uh, one I'm looking at recently, which I won't I don't need to go into. Um, it, it, it really is just an amazing story, but it all came from being asked to look into just one line in a book just one line in a book that's coming up of um, links between gangsters in Britain and um, arms trade. And it's led me down uh, a free part series investigation that goes across uh, 10, 20 years of um, really strange people who are really connected to some big uh, players, but disconnected from the political, uh, the, the heads of politics, etc. And nearly every single one of them are linked. And the original line is to see the arms trade and um, the illegal smuggling of arms and it's amazing you 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 see exactly the same all of the yeah. same people who are caught doing lots of other terrible things their day jobs are smuggling arms or selling yeah. illegal weapons to uh, um, some junta some some regime somewhere okay. um, it all gets a gloss of respectability doesn't it you know, mm-hmm. there, there was actually an arms trade um, an arms an arms fair in Liverpool a few months ago, and there's absolute uproar around yeah. here because we want we didn't want to see that happening in our system. Same in Cardiff, we had the same in Cardiff about four years ago, three years ago, um, where there was just a, a spontaneous amount of people who just come out and said, "No, we're not, we're, we're yeah. not having this. You're not selling your missiles here." And they say, "Well, no, it, right. it's it's all stuff like for medical troops and medical corps, and it's all good stuff. It's good arms, not bad arms, <laughs> yeah. you know." It's, that idea, but I mean, of course, the, the whole idea is the supporting of war. And again, this is, I think, what you were saying. It's not it, 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 we're fighting back better now because of the, the our understanding of the basics. You know, arms trade bad. That's it. <laughs> we 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 know this. So back then, four days before the invasion, yeah. and the some of the weapons that, or, or arms that are going to be used against the Brits are uh, still being sold to the... Yeah, um... 
That's right. The, and we had we, we had we had sold um, some of our Type 42 destroyers um, to the Argentinians as well, which which to me is okay, fair enough. Uh, you, you can do that. It's ten thousand miles away. You know, um, the, you, you wouldn't think. I think that happened a lot earlier than the, the Falklands, because you know, mm-hmm. the ships were, were actually used in the Falklands conflict. So the actual British destroyers, British-made yeah. destroyers, were used. Yeah. Because destroyers yeah. are a class of ship that are, are, are pretty serious. They're not small ships, oh, are they? Yeah. They are, yeah, they are. But to get back to the stuff that she was doing behind the scenes, um, um, what was the next one? Yeah, there was a guy called um, Nicholas Nicholas Ridley. He was a foreign minister in the Thatcher cabinet, um, and he was given a top secret mission. Um, to go and meet uh, Argentina's Deputy Foreign Secretary in Switzerland, in Geneva. And he, he toddled off there. And, and up for discussion was a lease-back deal of 99 years and shared sovereignty for the Falkland Islands between Argentina and the UK. And that would be a similar uh, affair to what went on in Hong Kong, as you remember, because that ran out in 1997. And Chris Patton um, hand, handed the handed Hong Kong over with great yeah. reluctance, I think, to China. You know, but that that was a deal that was trying to be set up by Nicholas Ridley, and it was all top secret. And the government, it, it's pathetic, really, but they put out a cover story saying that Nicholas Ridley had gone on holiday with his wife to paint watercolors by Lake Geneva. Where it's very scenic, you know, you can just imagine yeah. a pair of sitting there painting watercolors, you know. That would be comfortable. It's fantastic. It's fantastic for an investigator like me because every time I see an article like that in the past, I know what were they doing there, really? You know, yeah. it's 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 yeah. it's a, a, a big flashing uh, light to anybody oh. who realizes it, and usually you can only see it afterwards, anyway. Yeah. Um, but it's, so this was um, this was all top secret, and it was stressed. The, the, you can actually go and see the document now that that refers to this. Uh, with, which is stamped secret at the top, but one uh, there's there's a, there's a sentence in there saying um, absolutely no mention of this meeting must be made to anybody type of thing. You know, mm-hmm. I'm paraphrasing there, but um, but they had to go to to the Falkland Islanders and get their permission basically, or get their opinion on on this. And Nicholas Ridley did that. He travelled down there. I think it was. In 1980, sometime. And how down. many people at uh, this time live in the Falkland Islands? 1800. 1800. Yeah. So a small it's amount, it, relatively. It's more. Since doubled, back to about 3,000 now. But um, they basically gave gave him a good hearing, but gave him the bums rush and sent him on his way. You know, they weren't listening to that. They were. That that that, that shows that they're right. probably very British. <laughs> they didn't want. They didn't want Argentine flags flying on their flag masts, you know. They yeah. didn't, that's the last thing they wanted. But anyway, that failed. And but that but that just shows you that this was the direction of travel. You know, they, they wanted to get rid of these islands, and they didn't really care about them. Mrs. Mm-hmm. Thatcher, after the invasion, the first thing Mrs. Thatcher said was, um, "The interests of the Falkland Islanders are paramount." And she kept repeating that again and again and again. You know. Ad nauseum, uh, but she never said it once before the invasion. She, act- so, she actually acted opposite to that before. The so invasion. these were all like, uh, I mean, just in in probably our shared opinions, uh, like signals to the Argentinian government or the Argentines that look, we're not that interested. You can make your move. You can make your move. Um, yeah. Do you, do you think they would have had intelligence that the Argentin uh, Argentines or Argentinians? You can use both apparently. Yeah. Um, the, do do you think that um they they knew, had intelligence that said that they would be in a a winning position if they attacked the Falklands Islands or at least maybe even fed to them by the British? I really don't know, and I yeah. wouldn't want to speculate on that. I really course, don't yeah. know. Some okay. people will know that they'll know all the details of that, yeah. but you're never going to get that out of those people. <laughs> Well, not, that... not until you're 92, mate. Yeah. <laughs> not until you're 92. You know what? There's <laughs> more, though. I haven't finished, Johnny. There's more. Um, mm-hmm. There were defence cuts as well. Um, 
to all the armed services and in particular to the Navy. And the first Sea Lord was up in arms about this. Um, <laughs> I reaction. love that name. The first Sea Lord. <laughs> he rises from the oceans. <laughs> <laughs> Like a Neptune right. figure with a, a, a trident, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, he was up in arms about it, and um, he wanted to get a meeting with Mrs. Thatcher to discuss it, and she kept avoiding him. She wouldn't talk to him, you know. Eventually, he got he, he got a letter uh, to her that basically said, um, "Look, I've got a very good navy here. Um, I've got one which can react at the drop of a hat if there's an incident, you know." I can send ships there. But if you go ahead with these cuts, I don't like the look of them. I'm not going to be able to re- react. Uh, you've got to stop it now. And she just ignored it. She carried on with the cuts. One of those one of those cuts was the removal of a ship called um, Jesus. What, my, why is my head not working? Um, it was because yeah. Um, HMS was, reluctant to come into your mind. <laughs> it was the guard ship. I'm, it just, it, I just, I just know the name of it. It's, it's the guard ship for the Falkland Islands, a, a big red vessel, you know. And it used to sail around, um, around um, the islands. And it, um, uh, Lord Carrington, uh, he 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 wrote to Mrs. Thatcher and said, "Look, you can't get rid of that ship." She wanted to decommission it. He said, "You can't get rid of her." Um, She's not just a defence, a, a piece of defence. She's also a political statement showing that we are concerned about the islands and about the interests of the islanders. And again, she wouldn't listen to him either. Yeah. So, so it's like they were inviting it in 1981, just just towards the end of 1981, as, as the invasion was coming closer. So you were sailing then down. Uh, you come from uh, a Gibraltar again. Another place where where Britain has got their oar in and kept their oar in, um, and you you stopped in down by the equator before you actually moved down, didn't you? Yeah, at Ascension Island, we stopped there. Um, and Who the owns thing, Ascension Island? It's the UK, I think. Yeah, yeah. I think, sure it's the UK, but I think sure. America got some involvement. Mm-hmm. as well but it's an airstrip it's a huge airstrip on ascension island and that that is key without ascension island we could never have um, pulled pulled this off yeah, couldn't yeah. have done it you know it just wouldn't have been there's possible. not many allies down in south america for the british is there no, yeah. no that's a big problem yeah yeah apart from chile where you're sitting now chile was a big ally a pin of shame yeah, so yeah. Big, uh, chile is a very strange place Pinochet yeah. was a very evil man, and mm-hmm. and if you want uh, evil attracting evil, then Thatcher and Pinochet friendship is just a p- emblematic of that era, really. Um, the the, the like darkness. You like, yeah. you like Thatcher and Savile? I mean, yeah. Thatcher and Savile were meeting each other every every New Year's Eve for it's, eleven it, years. It's insane the reach he had. I was in Chequers, so I, I assume that started in 1979 because 11 years later she was out. So, we well, don't know. Fact, I, I mean, Sabo was right in with the, the Conservative Party. We paid for it all. We, we, we paid for all those meetings, and I don't think Sabo ever got vetted properly because if he was vetted pro- properly, he wouldn't have gotten near Thatcher or near Royal. Yeah, I, 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 I don't think they. Uh, vet people who are potentially involved in intelligence operations as well, and I get a feeling Savile had a bigger reach than is ever being ever going to be uh, investigated. Yeah. Um, yeah. His his connections, I mean, from for for people who don't understand, the previous Conservative government had been uh, Ted Heath government in the early seventies. Um, Thatcher had managed to get and a place in his cabinet so started to her rise really to 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 a leader then um and he f- it was the same he was surrounded by these um establishment linked uh pedophiles um it's uh, the thatcher uh cabinet and government it was also riddled with all sorts of accusations afterwards yeah. um about the people involved everyone from leon britain onwards so I, I mean it's really hard to understand what was happening there um 
but I think there was, and I, I mean, you can see by, uh, and this is getting off subject a slight bit, but the um, paedophile information exchange, PI, that was around that era as well, I think that was in the background. Uh, I think there was a lot of people who believed that because uh, gay rights was achieved in about 1969, I think it was, or uh, around there where it was, um, it was, it was suddenly not illegal. Buggery wasn't a crime, <laughs> as 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 they decided to do. Um, and and I think that even though that of course they're not related, um, I believe that a lot of paedophiles thought, well, if they can have their way. Why so, can't we have that way? And many of them were already in positions of power. Uh, many of them were or in power, were very sympathetic to pedophilia uh, because they had friends who were into the young form and stuff like this. You know, it's a very elite um, thing. One one investigation I did recently the, uh, on uh, the World Economic Forum, Klaus Schwab and his mentors um, came across Herman Kahn and Herman Kahn, who was classed as a real Dr. Strangelove, um, would say in about, I think about 19... Um, uh, 76, 77, he would say in an interview that the, the working class don't want to tell their children anything about sex. They don't want, you know, they don't want their kids to know, be taught anything in school. They don't want them to know anything. Wait till they get old enough to understand and then explain to them, uh, where the elites want to show their children how to have sex, want to encourage them and want to teach them personally. You know, it, that sort of, uh, is something that within the 70s i think was really present and before yeah. was really present yeah. that um the ownership of elites and establishment linked people um didn't only end uh in the political sense or power sense it also was at home it was at home where they believed they had uh, that same power and right over their own children, over the children that are around them. And most importantly, um, or most sinister of all, um, children of the working class and people that they ruled over. So I think there was an element where around that time we see the infiltration of cabinets of the British cabinet and same in over in America. I mean, God, some of the scandals that would happen over that period and onward that is just unbelievable. It's, it, it, it's sickening and Savile was definitely part. And there was a lot going on behind the scenes and Thatcher is right there, you know, encouraging all of this. So she's not a very nice lady anyway. Um, but, but this is, this is about you know what, to turn. What, what surprises me, Johnny, is that even to this day, I mean, Savile's come and gone now, and, and we we know all about her, his relationship with Thatcher. But even to this day, some people still admire Margaret Thatcher. Yeah. And I can't see where that's coming from. Yeah. And, uh, for, for example, um, the main historian for the Falklands conflict is uh, Sir, Sir Lawrence Friedman. And um, he, he appears to still have... Um, a lot of high regard for Mrs. Thatcher. I don't know if it's just because she successfully won that war, but you can't just do that in isolation. You've got to look at everything else as far as I'm yeah. concerned. Yeah. And I, I, I'll ask awkward questions on Twitter of people like that. And I've, there are three historians now who've blocked me on Twitter, you know, because I'm, I'm asking all for, as far as they're concerned, what are the wrong questions, you know? I'm asking stuff about the Belgrano and, you know, controversial things and i think we should keep asking as well yeah. uh, we shouldn't just settle for the settled version of events you know this the settled versions of events just in again in my opinion seem to come from um and i think it probably from evidence seem to come from people who had a dog in the fight who were in the eye of the storm who could not see uh the wood from the trees yeah. anyway because they were paid not to at the time and so it would make a mockery uh, of their whole life, of all of the beliefs that they've held over that those period of times, uh, that period of time. So it's really hard for for uh, these guys to ever accept what the truth is. The truth yeah. hurts. They won't accept that they are. If you accuse them of bias, they, they believe they're not being biased. Totally. How can I be biased? You know, but they so obviously are. They can't yeah. step back from that at all. They're so, like you say. In the eye of the storm, they can't yeah. stop. Well, it's, it's it's really amazing how some of the most educated people in um in in uh because my generation 
they removed uh, things like Roman history, uh, Greek philosophy, stuff like that. They removed it from the curriculum in Britain. They didn't want you learning about things like Marcus Aurelius and how he would spend. He would had he had techniques of thinking. So at the end of the day, he would spend the the night thinking about from a bird's eye perspective his whole day and how he acted with people and how what how he, he moved around and, and what he said and what he did. And it would give him a different idea of how to act in the future and how to treat people. Those lessons were taken out for a reason, yet these elites and the establishment still had that teaching and still had that. And, it, you know, they take away from our educational system to make us uh, emergent service workers, as they call us now, uh, you know, people who all work for them and work for the state and not question and not uh, be come across any information. And it works quite well. It works quite well. There's a load of people I, I meet, I'm, especially when I was, I, I mean, it's not, I've been over here about two weeks now. So it's, it's, my experience of Britain is very fresh and, and people are still in this haze where they don't want to ask the big questions. They're so scared yeah. of asking it, so they just avoid it. And they say, oh, no, I don't want to bother with that. I don't want to think about that. Oh, there's nothing I can do anyway in all of these um, stereotypical sentences. So let's get back to, to, uh -huh. to this. How did it how did it unfold then? What what happened that uh, when the ships got down to the Falkland Islands? Well, um for people who don't know the events. Yes. Um, the peace proposals, there were quite a lot of them. Um, none of them worked. And then there was a very important one that sort of came to fruition at the end of April. Right at the end of April, this was a Peruvian one. And it came from President Belond. Um, and it was quite, a, it was a seven point plan. And he gave it, it, it was worked out with Alexander Haig as well. And uh, President Belond gave it to Charles Wallace, who was the British ambassador in Peru. And Charles Wallace, on the 1st of May, allegedly, uh, sent this by telegram to London. Now, very importantly, on the 2nd of May, the Belgrano was sunk. I think at about five o'clock in the evening, UK time. Now, Mrs. Thatcher later stated that she didn't get the telegram until after the attack, which people worked out was uh, 17 hours later. So when I <laughs> think... That's how telegrams I, work. You know, I was, a, I was a radio operator. And even back then in 1982, I knew that a telegram arrived within seconds not 17 hours. So nobody has ever explained that situation for me, ever. Lawrence Friedman, I asked him about it on Twitter before he blocked me, and he couldn't explain this. He said something about HMS Conqueror's um, communications had gone down. I'm thinking, what? A nuclear submarine's communications has gone down. What's that got to do with a telegram being sent by an ambassador in Peru? to uh cnc fleet in london <laughs> that's nothing to do with it you know and and also a, a nuclear submarine with one form of communication that can go down and have no backup communication seems pretty nuts <laughs> that seems like yeah, the, the yeah. thing you don't want to happen with a nuclear submarine yeah i think you've got to come near to the surface to receive a, a very low frequency signal you know to to uh get in touch, you know, and that obviously brings its own problems when they come to the surface, they can be spotted. So anyway, um, but coming back to that telegram, um, as part of my research for the book, I went to the National Archive in the UK and did a little look around for the telegram and I couldn't find it. And then I discovered that all, all incoming telegrams from the South American continent sent to London have been embargoed for 40 years, like we were saying, until 2052. Now, I think that is one of them. That is that that one about the Belgrano, uh, or the one about the Peruvian peace proposals, that will figure there. And we were talking about President Pinochet as well before. I think his, whatever was coming out of the Chilean embassy will also be 
because there'll be probably some very sensitive stuff going on there as well. Yeah, and when you say sensitive, you mean illegal, uh, possibly just illicit, but m- mainly illegal. Um, well, that will make people question uh, the legacy of Mrs. Thatcher, I think. Yeah. You know, which which they is... will be eager to protect after the Savile thing. You know, they want to keep it as high as possible, but it's got to be questioned. You know, we, we can't question it if we can't see what's going on. Thatcher's legacy is inextricably linked with the Tory party and the future of the Tory party. So I think I think everybody knows. Oh, a lot yeah. of them stopped talking about it since Savile. Uh, <laughs> not anymore. Just the odd, the odd idiot, you know. <laughs> yeah, um, um, I, 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 and a couple of uh, radio show presenters. I say that, I'm not going to even mention their names. Um, and and then so so for for the 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 people the sinking of the Belgrano that's yeah. really a big thing, isn't it? Well, yeah, it's huge, yeah. And that was on the second of May, like I say. Uh, do you want me to go into some more detail on that? Yeah, yeah, go into a bit of detail, right. yeah. Yeah. Um, now the justification that we have now for the sinking of the Belgrano uh, came in 1992, so it came after ten years. Uh, it came from Sandy Woodward, who, like I say, was the man in charge of Oper- Operation Corporate. And he said that there was a pincer movement against the task force. So if you can imagine at this pincer, um, the sort of northern claw of the pincer, that was a, a Argentinian um, aircraft carrier called the 25 de Mayo. That was in the north. That was about 150 miles away or 200 miles away from the task force. The southern claw of the pincer was the Belgrano, which was about 350 miles away from the task force. So they're quite a distance away, both of them, uh, when the Belgrano was sunk on the 2nd of May. But very importantly, um, we're told about the 25th de Mayo and how its aircraft were a threat to the task force. And on, on the surface of it, they, it does look like a threat because those aircraft, they have a battle radius. They were Skyhawks. They had six Skyhawks and they were bombers. And they had a, a battle radius of 700 miles so they could fly off 350, drop the bombs, come back 350 and land safely on, on, on the aircraft carrier. So... On the surface of, of it, it looks like that is a threat to us. And the Belgrano, that, that was armed with, I think it was 12 or 15, six inch guns, huge guns, um, and 10, five inch guns. And it was, it was armed like that because it was built for the Second World War, for the sort of battles that they had then, ship against ship. You know, they would tear each other apart with, with that, that type of, uh, those kind of arms. The problem being the Belgrano would have had to reduce its distance from the task force by 336 miles to bring us within range of its guns. And if it had done that, it could have really caused a lot of damage. But in my opinion, it could never have done that. It would never have been given the chance to to do that. I mean, it wasn't given the chance because it, it got sunk when it was 350 miles away. It's my position that it wasn't a threat then when it was sunk. Sandy Woodward took 10 years to tell us that it was a threat. It, you know, it took him that long to get his ducks in a row and tell us that, that there was this threat. And everyone believes that. Not everyone, but most people believe that. And the media, they all believe that now, that that was the threat. But it wasn't. And going back to the aircraft carrier, on the 1st of May, if I'd have gone up top and had a look at the sea, it was just like a big blue billiard table. It was absolutely flat. Okay. It was a zero wind speed on, on the Beaufort scale. And the problem with that is an aircraft carrier needs a headwind to sail into to allow its aircraft to take off because they need the uplift under the wings. Yeah, 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 of course. Like, now these, the, each Skyhawk aircraft was loaded with, was laden with Four, four five hundred pound bombs, so every aircraft had an extra two thousand pound in weight to carry, and it had to be because it had to go and bomb the, the task force. He didn't even give the orders for them 
that those aircraft to take off when he was when he was within range because he knew they'd just go up the ramp and into the sea yeah. in those conditions. And, and and as far as I'm concerned, Admiral Vice Admiral Woodward knew that Rear Admiral Woodward, sorry, knew that he must have known that. You know, he knows the capabilities of of the the enemy, and he will have known that they couldn't uh, take off. Whereas we could take off, we had Harriers, which were vertical takeoff and mm-hmm. uh, horizontal quite takeoff. Quite amazing, quite um, amazing inventions. Yeah. When you search these things, you discover that it's not quite what they're telling us. The official history is not quite right on this. You know, mm-hmm. I think Admiral Woodward ma- made a mistake there in his assessment of that threat. Yeah. Do you um, think my, it was a mistake? Um. I really don't know. It's, it's speculation again, isn't it? I don't. I don't think it was uh, a mistake. You mean the sinking of the Belgrano a mistake? Is that what you're saying? Well, I, I, I don't think. I, I don't think you. We could see the, <laughs> but just his decisions, basically. All oh, right. Okay. Um, um, his calculations of the threat. Confusing. It's just confusing to me the way the way he. Uh, tried to get the uh, he, he tried to get the rules of engagement changed so that he could sink it, and then he, as far as I can see, built up this idea that there was a threat, you know, and then he didn't tell us what the threat was until ten years later. It doesn't add yeah. up. Yeah, it didn't add up for me. I, I remember I, I, I discussed this uh, to you in in a podcast that will never be heard. <laughs> um, I did I, I did say that my my it was one of the first times my dad had his name in print was uh, sending something into a a newspaper asking a question about uh, the sinking of the Belgrano because lots of people had uh, you know some serious they they couldn't understand what had actually happened and obviously when answers don't come back that make any sense then. The questions keep going, going on. Um, I remember saying it, it was sailing away. Why did we sink it? Because it was sailing away. It was outside the zone. I don't think that's as important as the, the other aspects. The fact that it would have taken a long time. It could have turned round at any point. That I, I agree with that. Mm-hmm. It could have, but it had been sailing westwards towards Argentina for fourteen hours. <laughs> and it didn't look like it was going to change course. Yeah. It wasn't. It wasn't a threat. I mean, by by the looks of of what we know, um, yeah. <laughs> by what we know. So, what happens next? Uh, what did well, the sinking uh, of the Belgrano lead to, really? Uh, on our ship, we knew that once that ship had been sunk and three hundred and three hundred plus sailors had been killed, we knew that there was no going back. It was going to be a war, uh, come what may. And you said earlier about, did you crap yourself? Or, <laughs> this was the point. <laughs> yeah, yeah, all right. This was prime <laughs> crapping <laughs> opportunity. <laughs> yeah. there, were kids, there were kids on our ship. There was one kid, he was only 16. Honestly, like he was 16 and a half. He'd come out of school, done his basic training, and his first his first posting was to HMS Yarmouth. And for God's sake, he thought he was going on that deployment to the Far East. Whoa, look at me, yeah. Mum. And he ends up going going to a war. He couldn't even drink beer. He couldn't even buy beer at that age. Oh my God! There should definitely be exemptions for that when you're at war. (laughs) Oh my Lord! So so then you found you fearful a lot of the time. You know, I I, I can see why. You know, you 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 are on your way to war, and and then and then it was war. So what was your experiences of that? What was that? I mean, for for people who don't know, how long did this last? Uh, 74 days altogether. It started on the 2nd of April, that was the invasion, and it finished on the 14th of June, 74 days uh, in total. I kept a diary uh, while I was down there. Uh, there were moments when things were quite quiet and you, you, you got time to, to write, you know, so I, I kept this diary. Every day I was writing down what was going on, you know, uh, and, at that, and in this book, um, that's the sort of um, the timeline of the book is is the diary. As you read the book, you read the diary sort of thing. So, yeah. um, but my my the morale the morale of the fellows on our ship was up and down all the time. You know, it was up when we thought 
things were going okay, and then the ship got sunk, and then it was down again. It was it was like a roller coaster, it really mm-hmm. was. Yeah, and it's not something you expected. <laughs> I mean, the very, next, the very next thing that happened after the the Algarano was sunk was the Sheffield was hit by an exoplanet. Yeah. We were only a mile away from that, so we went to to help, and we were firefighting and everything, and it was just the heat was just too intense, mm-hmm. and we had to pull away and. We actually picked, at, at that point, we, we detected a submarine, and to this day, we don't know, we don't think it was an Argentine submarine, um, we think it could have been a Russian submarine, mm-hmm. and we picked up torpedoes that were fired at us as well. All this has been poo-pooed by the MOD, because the MOD don't believe that uh, the Argentinians could ever have mounted a, co- a coordinated exocet and submarine attack against wow. a, a t- so they've always said, no way was that submarine. You, 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 you dreamt that, whatever. But I tell you what, our our, our, uh, our uh, flight commander, who was the um, the pilot of our Wasp helicopter, he went up uh, while the Sheffield was uh, there on fire, and he saw the submarine. He actually saw it, and he came straight back to tell the captain, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, so we we know there was a submarine there. But anyway, I'm going, I'm going off the subject a little bit, but uh, our morale was back, was was down there, you know, uh, when the Sheffield was hit. Mm-hmm. And uh, we took the captain off, Captain Salt, and I went up to the bridge and I saw him slumped in a chair, head bound, and I've never seen a man look so crestfallen, you know. Yeah. You, well, you just lost, uh, just lost one of the Queen's ships. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And that meant something to those guys, for sure. That meant it something did, to those yeah. guys, yeah. So what happened next then? What happened next, Paul? This is, uh, I um, mean, d- 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 I can't even imagine because like you said, like, like we were saying, uh, this isn't, uh, it wasn't usual for the Army or Navy to, or the Air Force to end up in a conflict at this point, was it? No, not at all. I mean, uh, I mean the Army has had its conflicts, Northern Ireland, that sort of thing, and others uh, since the Second World War, the Navy. All we'd had was the Cod War in, 19, in the 1970s, uh, but it was nothing like uh, Second World War. This was more like Second World War, you know, planes coming in and bombing us and the, a naval threat as well, which never materialised, but mm-hmm. it was sort, sort of, uh, you know. Um, but, sorry, I lost me thread a little bit there. <laughs> no, I'm just wondering what, I mean, I, what the experience did for you. What, 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 what a... Yeah, I mean, how did it? How did it end up? How did the Falklands end for the people who are, like I say, Americans and have no, no no knowledge of all of this British nonsense? Yeah, well, the events started happening one after the other. Then we had the day, we had the day of the landings. The troops were landed, um, and then on that day when the troops were landed was a um, a big day, I suppose, because we were. The amount of the amount of planes that came over from the mainland, it was just it just kept coming and coming, and the bombs kept coming. And HMS Ardent got hit, and once again we were very close to HMS Ardent. It was bombed 17 times. The back end, the rear, of the, the the stern of the ship was just blown apart. And I was I was off watch then, and I went up top to help out, and I, I could see the thing, and just flames and smoke billowing out of the back end. And there were two guys who were actually stuck on the back end with life jackets on. And there was no way they could go forward where all the other guys were. But the other guys were relatively safe and they, they, they were getting off on, onto our ship. We were right next to them, you know. But they got these two guys on the back end. They only had life jackets on. on. They didn't have survival suits on. So if they went into that sea, they had about two minutes um, to uh, before they'd be, you know, dead. And I watched a pair of them jump in into the sea and just float off. And then over my shoulder came a Wessex helicopter from HMS Broadsword. It, it had seen this happening and it, it, it winched them both up. And Did he survive? I only found out yesterday. I watched, I watched a video on YouTube. A guy, um, Commander en- Entiknap, his name was. He was one of those guys who jumped into the sea. And from what he was, obviously he survived, yeah. 
and his mate, I assume, survived as well because I was watching this video and he was he, he mentioned the other fellow's name. He didn't say that he died, so I assume they both survived. Mm. And I only found that out yesterday watching this yeah. video, you know. Yes, sir. So, um, like I say, it was one after the other. It was the the Sigal I had, you know, that that was the biggest loss of life for us in, in one go. Um, uh, that that was Bond, and then um, and then we had Goose Green, and we had Colonel H. Jones dying. You know, all the, all these events going on, and at, at the end of the war, um, or towards the end of the war, Reagan actually came in and said. Let's have a peaceful resolution to this. This is before, obviously, before the surrender. Let's have a peaceful resolution, Mrs. Thatcher. And she just sent him on his way. No, we're going to drive yeah. on. I'm going to punch them out. So, so lots of lots of people died after, after that, you know, on both sides after that. Mm-hmm. And we got victory, of course, in the end. Um, but I think Miss, I think Ronald Reagan, he had. Um, he had loyalties to uh, South American countries and to the British, so he was a bit torn between the two, sort of thing. Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. He was it's trying, like, trying. They so had he their said, fingers in so many Latin American pies and South American yeah, pies. Yeah, they had, you'll know Operation Condor, um, which yeah. in Argentina was called the Dirty War, and, and tens of thousands of people went missing. Yeah. Obviously, they're dead. You were tortured. You were even thrown out of helicopters into the sea and stuff mm-hmm. like that going on. You know, and, and this was all because of uh, Henry Kissinger and Richard Nixon who started it off, you know, yeah. uh, back in the 70s. Um, truly, truly two two men who uh, caused masses amount of pain for a lot of people. Kissinger, Kissinger especially. And... Kissinger's still on the loose now. And he's, I know, he's, I know. That's people's respect, and I just don't know how. I don't I, know how. He's a war I criminal. Think, I think it's because if you nod your uh, cap to Kissinger, you may get a position in the Council on Foreign Relations. I think that's that's kind of the way it is. Is that you have yeah. to you have to bow down to the old gods if the new gods are going to lift you up. You know. Um, is there, and also, I mean, you look at Kissinger, I think it was the Ar- Argentinian World Cup, wasn't it? The, the final, he came along, went downstairs in the, the tunnels with, with the president, and then suddenly they threw the match, the other side threw the match. <laughs> I didn't know that. Yeah, what? yeah, it's a really strange one. It's Kissinger just turns up at the World Cup final or the semi-finals. I think it's the World Cup finals. And basically, they go into the, the locker room, something weird happens, and then they, the the... the the side throws them the match and Argentinians go away, I think, as as the victors. It's a very strange affair. Everything he was involved in is dirty, even, including yeah. wars, you know, everything. Still. Very interesting, man. Very interesting period of history. So eventually it came to an end. Yeah. All of this unnecessary death and unnecessary it led to the Falklands being back under British rule. And then um, do you know if there was any changes in the policies towards the Falklands uh, about them being able to come back to or go to Britain? And did they did they change any of those policies? Yes, she did. Mrs. Thatcher changed the British Nationality Act that she'd imposed before the invasion. She changed it back so that they could, so that they were British citizens. Yeah. They got full um, protection. The protections yeah. that had been stripped away before were returned. Yeah. And it was a popular move and it got her voted back in. You know, It's terrible that she was yeah. the one who made it in the first place. I might sound like a cynic when I say that. So, but I, I, when, when people accuse me of being a cynical, I say I'm passively cynical. My cynicism is hopefully will educate people. Whereas if you're an active cynic, it causes destruction and harm. And people like Tony Blair. They're actively cynical, you know. Yeah, well, God, let's not get on to Tony Blair now. Or we'll be another hour and I've got to go and pick up the <laughs> yeah, kid. Yeah. <laughs> um, listen, tell us about your what, what led you then? I mean, you, you self-published this book? Yeah, I did, yeah. Um, I don't think any of the main publishers would take this on. Because it's too controversial, you know. Uh, there's too many uh, truths in it that 
would not see the light of day through a, a main publisher, you know. So, um, but saying that, I've managed to get it into one of the local bookshops on Wirral, you know. Uh, yeah, yeah that's that, good. Um, but it is on Amazon, you know, you can get mm-hmm. it there. And I counted, Forward. there's about 33 different outlets where you can where you can buy this book, yeah. That's good. That's good. Well, it's, a, it's, a, it's a good thing. It should be thousands, though, shouldn't it? And it should be that everybody has the right to uh, make up their own mind about uh, a subject, especially something that's got that, that's been so uh, heavily researched by somebody. Um, so it's called Return to Bomb Alley, 1982, uh, The Falklands Deception. Um, yeah. And and the the best place to buy it is your own site here. Yeah? Yeah, you can go. You can go to my website and buy it there, and you can pay via PayPal, um, and you'll get a signed copy. You know, but mm-hmm. it's probably easier to go to eBay. I've just started selling it on eBay, and uh, you get a signed copy, and and it'll cost you nine ninety nine, and it's the same price as an unsigned copy. So it's it's you probably better go to eBay and buying it there, or you can buy it on Amazon. You can get it uh, as an ebook or as a printed book on Amazon. And this isn't going to be your only uh, soiree into being a a, a, a writer. You, you're planning yeah. on uh, doing another book afterwards, I believe, but a little bit different. I've been writing over the last sort of four or five years, and it's going to be science fiction related. So it's totally different to this, mm-hmm. you know. No, this is pretty. This is pretty much like science fiction when you actually look at what the the, 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 the uh, official story is meant to be, isn't it? Yeah. It's, I mean, the some, looks some science fiction from the past is now coming true, as mm-hmm. you can probably see. <clears throat> I'm a big Philip K. Dick fan, and I think some of the stuff he wrote about is uh, you can, you... the past. You know, the, in the same way that George Orwell, uh, his his um, his fiction <laughs> eventually turns to fact. Well, I've said this a few times. His fiction is is what his mates at the time were talking about, what they were planning on. So, I mean, this is this is what you get. Same with the Huxleys as well, and other people. Is a, a grand conspiracies are invented a long time before they're enacted, and they all talk about them, and everybody writes them down. And then when they come to pass, they look like fiction because that's with yeah. the flavour they've been given already. Um, like you say about technology being ten years ahead, well, you know when it comes down to uh, that stories the stories of the future are written in the past and they uh, they inspire don't they? they inspire paul it has been wonderful to speak with you and uh, i look forward to getting this out um i i i desperately i will want you to come back on this show again to talk about other things um more I can talk about Johnny. Uh, yeah. I was yeah. a, I was a whistleblower once at uh, Wirral Council, um, mm. and since then my eyes were sort of opened to what what's going on in the world, you know. And yeah. ever since then I've been helping people who uh, get bullied in the workplace. So I've been, you know, um, I want I want to I want to get involved and um, do as much as I can to. Fix the world, something. Good on, good on you. I, I feel, I, I feel just the same. Um, I, I, I feel bullied in the workplace. <laughs> I, I do. I, feel, I, I mean, I feel, uh, even, even however much experience I've got, and however much I'm able to fight my corner, um, I still have loads of experience of all of these different, uh organizations trying to pick me apart or pick bits of me off whether it be energy companies lying about bills or whether it be uh, uh anyone you complain about uh or with real actual concern turning it round on you and trying to make you look like you know i've 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 had it all throughout my life i've had it all i've seen other people have it as well and i i think the, 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 straight away. When, when i blew the whistle at will council i was just a troublemaker that's yeah. that's the way they explore it well you gotta you gotta live by that it's, it's a, a, cre- a credo is an ethos is you gotta go forward as a troublemaker if that's what they make you then that's what we gotta do isn't it yeah yeah definitely. yeah hey listen thanks for coming on and um thanks for for, for coming on the second time because like i said uh the first one will never see the light of day because the audio on my end was so bad and i apologize profusely for that really appreciate this and paul 
Um, anything else you want to say to me before we go? That's it. Thanks, Johnny. It's been great. Yeah, awesome. I will we'll speak soon. Have a nice one. See ya. What we know is that we will end up with many more unemployed uh,